What I want to do is talk about some very broad concepts, prop causes, problems, and solutions. And I will go through these one by one with the hopes that I may give you some new ways of thinking about things and possibly some inspiration for some new kinds of actions. It wasn't until the 1960s, really, as we began to recover from the age of gluttony and consumption that followed World War II, where we were so excited to consume everything, to drive cars everywhere, and to do everything, that the idea of conservation would have been almost unthinkable. Uh, in the 60s, uh, for example, at the beginning of the 60s, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, came out. David Brower's This is the American Earth, and a variety of things began to tweak the system and make people begin to think about the environment for the first time. And of course, the progression through the 60s led eventually to Earth Day in April 1970, which in turn, which drew out 20 million people, one out of 10 of all the people in the United States, to a specific event. And that was uh, such a major outpouring of sentiment for the environment that it was inevitable almost that our basic environmental legislation passed over the next few years in the early 1970s. It was an incredible time. It was not a time when we thought of the, when we thought of the whole international situation, which is what I'm gonna spend most of my time on today. It was not until 1971 that a conference was held where people really began to worry about the relationship between nations and the differences between nations uh, in dealing with one another, in surpassing one another, in competing with one another, in trading with one another as having an effect <clears throat> on the environment. Now this beautiful planet Earth, if you were a traveler from another planet and there were no human beings here, so it was a relatively nice place, uh, <laughs> the thing that would amaze you the most would be life on Earth, the tremendous living envelope of 12 billion species of complex organisms and tens of millions probably of species of bacteria many of them sitting inside you and secreting and excreting and eating and doing all sorts of nasty things, as Jeff Gordon told us earlier. <laughs> that kind of relationship is one that we're just discovering now, but it's the complex relationships between all the other organisms on Earth that support life on Earth, including our own. <clears throat> now, human beings, uh, Organisms similar enough to humans that they've been considered humans appeared on Earth about two million years ago, and you've all read many stories about them appearing in different parts of the world and the fossils and all of that. And since the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, human beings appearing two million years ago is just like yesterday, like the blinking of an eye. What's even more recent and quite amazing is the origin of agriculture. The origin of agriculture took place, now we think in Turkey, what's now Turkey, about 12,000 years ago. In other words, virtually yesterday in a 4.5 billion year Earth. At the time when agriculture appeared or was developed by our ancestors, the entire population of the whole world was something like three million people. In other words, all six habitable continents had about the population of St. Louis on them spread out over all the continents. That's 12,000 years ago, yesterday. As people developed agriculture, they had a way to store food, a way to put food away, a way to, uh, something to wage battles over, something to grow towns, villages, cities, larger and larger units within which people could specialize their professions. And as they specialized their professions, all of this during the last 12,000 years, uh, we be, we, they developed what we now consider civilization. 
If you consider that when there were three to four million people on all six of the world continents going around in bands of 20 to 40 people, there wasn't, and rarely coming into contact with one another, there wasn't a whole lot of room to begin to develop uh, uh, professions like uh, musicians, farmers, storytellers, lawyers, civic and religious leaders, and all the rest, simply because people were all busy supporting themselves and simply living. As time went by, in the increasing cities, towns, and cities of the world, languages were developed about 5,000 years ago. They were developed along the Nile in Egypt, they were developed in the Middle East, and then they were developed slightly later in China in the Orient independently, written languages. And since we have a 5,000 year threshold of written languages, it's not strange that our historical accounts, our historical memories go back about 5,000 years. And anything that we write or hear about what happened before 5,000 years ago that hasn't been verified by science, for example, by digging in the earth or looking at fossils or calculating what the past was like in other ways, was carried to the point where we had written language by legend, by story, by influential people uh, in the sense of telling things that people wanted to know talking to one another, singing to one another, entertaining one another. So before 5,000 years ago, the past gets quite nebulous. Now here's world population growth, and there are a couple of interesting things about this. By the time, uh, by 1500, by 500 years ago, as you can see, the global population had grown to a few hundred million. One of the interesting things to note is that at the time of Thomas Malthus, who's the famous man who predicted that people were not likely to be able to produce enough food to support themselves, and if, they, and if uh, the population kept growing as it was, that they would overwhelm the productive capacity of the earth. That was in 1790s. <clears throat> and as you can see on that diagram, the advances made in the Industrial Revolution, such as uh, manufactured fertilizer, plows, mechanized plows, the ability to move water from one place to another, did provide food. Although many people starved subsequently, it was not a total disaster in the sense that Malthus had predicted it. And the dots on the line from there on represent billion people more than the earlier dots. So a billion, a billion, a billion, and now we're at about 7.1 billion. The high point in population growth was in 1971 in percentages, but the high point in numbers was in the early 1990s because the base kept getting larger, so every year there were more people, even at a lower rate of growth. Now we're at 7.1 billion, and UN projections are for 11 billion at the end of the century, and uh, two, two and a half, two to two and a half billion more by the middle of the century. Now, one could logically think of population as the only driving force beyond the ills that beset the world now and the difficulties that we have in seeing how to get forward into the future. And it's very, it's popular and seems logical to say that, and certainly, the number of individual human beings on Earth has a profound effect on the Earth, has a profound effect on the Earth, particularly when the influence of cities goes out so far beyond those cities. Actually, our impact on the Earth is a combination of population, the absolute number of people, the level of consumption per person, which, uh, for example, those of us here in this auditorium consume at about 30 times the level that people do in rural Brazil or rural Indonesia. We each consume about 30 times as much. So the addition of a million people to the population of the United States has about the same effect as the addition of 30 million people to the population of rural Brazil. And then, of course, there's technology, which we hear so much about these days. The kinds of technology that we use profoundly affect 
the outcome and our impact on the earth. And an idea of consumption can rapidly be gained from these two images. This is one week of food for a Western European family. And this is one week of food for a Western African family. And the comparison between those two ought to begin to sensitize us to the tremendous differences in the world. And then technology, the effects of technology in air pollution, to just give one simple example, are well known and we can improve our impact on the earth, we can lighten it by improving technology. But where are we now? The Global Footprint Network, a think tank in Oakland, California, Global Footprint Network, accounts for ecological services, accounts for the goods that we get from the landscape, including the absorption of pollutants and so forth. In terms of biocapacity, how much bioproductive area is available to us, and that could be to an individual, to St. Louis University, to the St. Louis community, or to the United States, compared with the ecological footprint, how much bioproductive area do we demand? And here are some of the things that go into uh, the ecological footprint, our pollution, our effects on forests, our effects on water, our production of, uh, of uh, greenhouse gases causing global warming and so forth. And to bring that to life, here's <clears throat> the Global Footprint Network map of the world in 1961 with the dark green representing highly productive, highly more productive than, than is internal in that country, and the varying shades of brown reflecting that that country is overusing what it has. <clears throat> in other words, depends on imports from other countries to, to maintain its standard of living. And there you have basically Western Europe, Egypt, and uh, India slightly on that side of the curve. This is what the same map looks like in 2005 with the dark brown meaning importing lots of sustainability, whether that's water, fuel, food, whatever from other countries to support the standard of living. The United States uses the productive capacity we use of about two and a quarter times our area to support our current standard of living, although we live on a kind of a myth that we support our standard of living entirely within our own borders. <coughs> Japan uses seven times its own productive capacity, China about two times, and so forth. That means that all of the nations in the world are interacting with one another. What's even worse, and one of the two important things that I want to say to you today is that we're using about 150% of the sustainable capacity of the earth on an ongoing basis. In other words, we're using the productive capacity of about one and a half planet Earths. As recently as 1970, we were using about 70%. So population growth, consumption rates, and technology have a very profound effect. One billion of the 7.1 billion people are malnourished. In other words, they don't receive enough food as children to have their brains develop properly, and when they're adults, their bodies are wasting away. A hundred million people in the world are estimated to be on the verge of starvation at any one time. And as I said, the world population is, est is growing at about 200,000 200, people a day net right now. So what are we headed for? <coughs> <coughs> malnourishment. Remember, the important point that I want to make about malnourishment, a lot of, uh, of which has been said so well today, is that uh, if we had another half of the planet Earth if we had 50% more capacity, we'd still have a, a billion people malnourished and 100 million on the verge of starvation. The only difference being we wouldn't be using the principle, but just the interest, the productivity of the world to support our standard of living. If you turn then to biology and think about the interrelationships in a scene like that between farming, 
uh, productive hillsides that have been partly planted, uh, natural hillsides or relatively natural hillsides that are protecting the flow of water, the biodiversity, the retarding loss of topsoil and so forth. You see how human beings at best live in kind of a balance with the world and in turn how the world provides an incredible array of ecosystem services to us. One of the many things that's affecting biological diversity and driving the plants and animals on which we depend for our survival to extinction so rapidly is global climate change. And if you want to see global climate change, of course, look around you. When I got to St. Louis in 1971, uh, evergreen magnolias belied their name by dropping off their leaves every winter. Uh, you couldn't grow camellias out of doors. Crepe myrtles died back to the base every winter, and those dang armadillos stayed away from our beautiful river city here. Now they're knocking on the door. And if you want trouble, just think about armadillos in your garden. Now there are only nine gardening zones on there, and in the 16-year period mapped, look at the state of Missouri, how it's changed in terms of the nine gardening zones in the United States. Look how the tropical zones at the south have expanded, and the blue, the, the colder zones at the top have contracted. Bark beetles have killed millions of acres of coniferous trees in the western United States, Canada, and Alaska by getting through with one more brood each year in warmer climates. And of course, sea level rise presses right on and will cause incredible difficulties to the world unless we can do something better than saying, Maybe we'll reach some agreement about climate change in 2020. Uh, meanwhile, let's tread water and just try to do things on a voluntary basis. The problem is, of course, that if all the ice in the world melts, it's, uh, the sea level goes up 185 feet, and that's something that we're not going to want. Policy recommendations for the United States, which would be the same as policy recommendations for China or any other country, is to maintain internal sustainability to the degree possible, to slow the momentum of population growth. All our economics practically are based on population growth and expansion. What we really need to do is reach stability. We and everybody else need to reach stability and as I've already demonstrated to you, we depend on sustainability of other countries all over the world to stay where we are. We need to consider what levels of consumption can be achieved and maintained, and that, that could turn into a very popular political slogan, vote for me and I'll help you to reduce your level of consumption. <laughs> No, what we like are things like Ronald Reagan, we want the shining city on the hill where everything's wonderful, or every nation in the world by working hard will turn out to be great. And then we need to revise our economic strategy in the face of its global context. All of those things really need to be done regardless of their unpalatability or the difficulty in reaching them. We are affecting the earth in a major way, and as I've just implied by talking about the, the uh, political context that we're operating in, it will be very difficult to change things. In fact, uh, <coughs> Roderick Jones put it very well when he pointed out in his own beautiful words that it's love for one another that will really help us to solve this problem and no amount of ranting and raving like I'm doing today, no amount of facts being presented to people and all, will make them think that the world situation is more important than their own life and driving their kid to soccer games and uh, uh, getting groceries and seeing who's coming over for dinner and repairing the roof. But the fact of the matter is we're heading down the shoot the shoots and we're heading down them very rapidly. We need nothing less than a moral change and inspiration which will help us to understand that we need to love one another on earth and we need to love one another to such a degree that we're willing to act in the benefit of other people. It's always difficult for me to see how we're gonna love people in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa going from 950 million 
to 2.2 billion in the next 36 years, and look how unstable it is now. It's always difficult for me to see how we're gonna love people around the world if we don't love poor people right here in St. Louis. Several speakers have brought that out very clearly. And of course, actually, segregation, not only on the basis of race, but on the basis of economic status, is morally abhorrent and is unworkable. In fact, cherishing diversity would be the single most important thing we could do in the United States to bring ourselves to a profitable, productive, and sustainable future. It's all a matter of individual choices in lifestyle and in many other ways. You must never think that your individual choices and your influence on one another are negligible because in fact they're not only highly important, they're the only thing that we can really do in the face of the uh, uh, situation that I pointed out to you for the United States and the world right now. Thank you very much.